So we have come up to asanas. Now, of the eight parts of Patanjali Yoga, um, Yoga Sutras, the sadhana para, the practice section, we have done up to us. Now we go to pranayam. Now let me uh, give a background on this. The simple practices of pranayam, like breathing in and out, and being aware of the breath, is uh, you can find it in various uh, other uh, darsanas also, disciplines also, not only in the yoga darsanas, but also like in Viveka Chodamani, which is a Vedantic text. Shankara says that if your mind is not steady and if you're not able to watch your breath or breathe in and out, in the Viveka Chodamani, it's called Nadi Shuddhi. So pranayam, that kind of simple pranayam is meant for Nadi Shuddhi. Now we have to explain, I have explained once before, that according to yogic anatomy physiology, yogic anatomy physiology, the body has, uh, the human body has innumerable Nadis. We have a habit in ancient times, and there are so many to say 108 Nadis, but let's say that there are many nadis in the system. Out of these nadis, first of all, the premise is that these nadis or channels, or um, channels through which prana operates, prana meaning not just oxygen, but life energy, mm -hmm. I want to make a, a distinguish the two words, prana and shvasa. Now, shvasa is breath only. Prana includes shvasa and also the inner energy that sustains the system, the which looks after the digestion. All these are called prana, apana, samana. There are many kinds of pranas divided. Some two oh, for metabolism. There is anabolism and catabolism, right? And human body has metabolism. That's how it works. So anabolism is structuring the body. And catabolism is destroying the old cells, throwing out the waste, and so on and so forth. So for both, all these, the energy that works doing all this is called the uh, prana. And prana and shvasa are intimately related. Which is why the word pranayama, when you say it, means the rules and regulations of prana. They are also intimately connected with the shvasa, with the breath, fortunately. Otherwise, the human being would not be able to control the functioning of his prana. It functions anyway. Suppose I decide I need to function it and use it in a particular way. If the breath was not connected to the prana, then it would not have been possible for us to do that. So, luckily, it is possible. The yogi believes that much of the disorders, the body and the mind, are caused by an imbalance of the pranas. So, one of the ideas, one of the uh, reasons for, for pranayama, how to learn the rules and regulations of how prana operates, is to put this imbalance back to its balanced state. Because a mind which is imbalanced, which has imbalanced pranas, cannot do, cannot sit down, meditate, go deep within oneself, all this is not possible. Even the yogis say that if the prana is imbalanced, it is not properly balanced, you actually cannot even fix your attention one pointedly to something. Uh, attention deficiency syndrome, hideous. One of the ways I think can be experimented, where ADS can be changed, especially in the young who go to school, is by prescribing simple pranayama. That puts the prana in order. And when there is a balance, then the attention becomes steady. Otherwise, it's difficult for attention to become steady. And as we go along, we'll understand this. So, 
pranayam or there is the other side of pranayam which is since it is connected to the breath to shwasa uh, when the mind is calm no first let me explain so there are so many nadis and he, through these nadis for various functions including functions to take one to meditative states the prana operates but it doesn't operate at its optimum level and in its proper way generally sometimes it does sometimes it does not um for the yogi the three most important nadis are the one that starts from here crosses here inside not outside and goes down to the right side and the one that starts on the right crosses at the ajna and goes down to the left side and meets at the end of the spine muladhara now if you look at this you will find many similarities but i don't think the nadis are exactly what what are the anatomical uh, structures we are discussing but very close so there may be some connection between them that is you will see that this from the head from the uh, cerebellum i'm sorry cerebrum to the end of the uh, mm, backbone inside there is the nadi is called shushumna shushumna is very if you look it actually the spinal cord goes straight down i would say that the shushumna is a nadi that flows in close a proximity to the spinal cord probably and the left nadi which has started from the right and gone to the left and which probably you know that today the uh, uh, neurologists have come to this understanding that even though we have only one brain we have two lobes the left brain and the right brain and some functions are performed perfectly when the left brain operates and some functions are performed beautifully when the right brain operates now it's this is known now for instance uh, the right brain is the practical brain and sorry the left brain is the practical brain the arithmetical brain which calculates distances this that and so on and the it says you are sitting here there is a table in front of you the camera is there and distances spaces feeling this is the left brain and the right brain well both op operate together in coordination but i'm just saying that more some of these are stressed in one side than the other the right brain is generally called the intuitive brain it's useful in creativity great artists great writers great uh, singers great dancers any creative activity those who do well according to the neurologist the right brain works in a bit more than the left in that we discuss jim balls uh, stroke of insight in one session here and that what happened to her was that her left practical brain was completely paralyzed i mean it was filled with blood and it stopped working because of the hemorrhage the right brain took over because the right brain to cover and the intuitive brain it moves on creativity and intuition not on measurements so jill felt that she her her being was not confined to the limited space of which her body is which is calculated by the left so she found herself also spread out her consciousness she the bird which was singing she found was she singing the trees which were swinging in the wind was herself there is no difference sometimes one wonders if this is what the the great upanishads talk about that you and i and everything is one maybe they 
somebody has such an experience, maybe I have, without a hemorrhage, which is not that we have experiments, controlled experiments to bring about deliberate hemorrhages. No, no, no. Not that. I'm just giving you an example. So, um, uh, hello, Sonika Ji. She just appeared on the screen. So, um, that's one part of it. So, the left nadi, which starts from the right side and goes down, is called the Ida nadi. If you read, Yoga Sutras don't go into elaboration. You read the Yoga Pradipika. The Yoga Pradipika, Shiva Samhita, Garanda, one of these textbooks. And also Yoga Tantra textbooks. You will see this. The left is called Ida Nadi and the right is called the Pingala Nadi. Now the Pingala Nadi is uh, considered to be plus. I am deliberately avoiding uh, the word positive and negative because it doesn't mean that it is positive in the positive sense of the term. But it's a charge. It's a plus charge. Right. So in electrical language, you can say it is anode. And the left nadi, the Ida nadi, is called the cathode. I mean, it's not called the cathode. It's, ne it's negative. When I say negative, not that it's negative that way. But it is the, uh, it's the cathode, minus. We require plus and minus to anything to operate. And this, for this wiring also it is required. Now, uh, the central one is called the Shushumna, straight channel. For most purposes that we live on this earth, all the actions we perform, all of them, need only the prana to function through the ida and the pingala. The shushumna need not, is, does not come, need not come into the picture at all. Because all the parasympathetic nerves that comes out from the spine and form the plexuses are the ones that operate everything. Not the spine directly. Yeah, if the spine is cut or something happens, you are paralyzed. Because there is no function happening after that. Understand. But generally it is these, so the right and left vagus nerves, the parasympathetic nervous system, they control the heart, they control the lungs, they control digestion, they control breathing, they do everything. In fact, therefore, the yogi is able to voluntarily control these, the prana in these two areas, so that he can control his breath, Long periods, it doesn't need to breathe, not to be tried unless uh, one wants to end one's life. Um, long periods, he, a yogi can sit without breathing, in or out. And have been, there have been ex, um, cases of people burying themselves in the ground. Separate the frauds who have a tube going from underneath and coming out somewhere, like a drainage system, but actual ones where they have dug a hole, sat inside, um, taken a deep breath, held it there, closed the thing, and then come out after three days or four days. Some yogi was recorded in Punjab to sat for seven days. And uh, it was done in, in the presence of the British collector who made sure that there are no tubes running out of this. So, that is the extraordinary control over the breathing, the heart and so on, and circulation, which the yogi exercises because he knows how to exercise, how to control or manipulate the prana. For according to Yoga Tantras, for the yogi to go into higher levels of consciousness, what is required is not the ida and the pingala, the prana to flow through the central channel called Kishushumna. And all the centers called the chakras are located on the spine, in the Shushumna, sorry. Um, so therefore, what the yogi practically does 
is to bring the prana from the ida and the pingala, plus and minus, positive, negative, cathode, anode, together at the muladhara and strike it. What happens when you have normal cathode, anode, in two wires striking, what happens? There's a spark. In the Yoga Tantra, this spark is called Bindu. And this spark is with the mind, using the mind to control it, is made to rise up. There's no actual spark, please. Whatever. And is made to go up the spine through the Shushumna. When it reaches the top, which is the Sahasrara, one is supposed to mm, have transcended the ordinary mind. I can only say that much. Cannot say more than that. You have transcended the ordinary mind and uh, you are no longer the three-dimensional person that you were before. In fact, that is one of the proofs of what yoga calls samadhi. If a fool goes into samadhi, he comes out a wise man. If it is not samadhi, a wise man may go into it and come out a fool. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> wise man will never become a fool. What I mean is a different matter. Mm. So uh, <clears throat> this is the whole system. So since the prana or the breath is connected intimately to the shwasa, to the breath, Various techniques of pranayam have been worked out to control these energies, these pranas. It's elaborate. However, a simple thing to note, simple thing is, if I am agitated, I am agitated. If I look closely at the rhythm of my breathing, you find that my breathing pattern is very agitated. When one is very angry, just watch oneself. One is usually breathing hard. I think it should kill this guy. You know, uh, anger. Uh, it's also there when high emotions come, one breathes very heavily. It's also when one works hard physically and is just finished digging, there is a heavy breath going on there. So when you're tired, what do you generally, when you work the whole day, nowadays nobody does that kind of work. Suppose I go to the estate and work in the coffee estate, along with the laborers, pruning the coffee and digging and so on. Then at the end of it, I become very tired, naturally. So what is the usual reaction? I'll go slum myself in a chair and do... <laughs> an unconscious pranayam, actually. Two, three times when I... Uh, you see, sometimes you do ha. Uh, they revived. So, what I'm trying to say, when your mind is agitated, when our mind is agitated, if you look closely, you will see that your pattern of breathing, your rhythm is very heavy and uncertain and irregular. On the other hand, Suppose it's a beautiful scene, you're sitting in the... Today I'm looking a proper brown color in the screen. Uh, two, three days I was whitewashed. <laughs> so, when you're very calm, suppose you're sitting near uh, the river, water's flowing. In fact, when I first went to... Um, Rishikesh and was sitting with uh, my teacher, Maheshwarnath Babaji. I thought he's going to teach me this Kundalini Yoga or something and so on. And nothing happened. He, we were staying in a little cave called uh, Arundhati Cave. I think Dr. Jyoti has seen the cave. I was sitting there and uh, on the, below the cave, on the other side, if you sit and face from the cave, you see the river flowing. And it's a very unbusy kind of quiet area of the Ganga, not like upper Rishikesh, or lower Rishikesh. The blue water flows over the rocks and the 
this little rivulets form because it goes over the rock. He said, I tried to meditate. I closed my eyes. I couldn't meditate. Babaji said, open your eyes. Aankh kholo. Or Ganga ko dekho. I thought, what is this? Hey, Ganga. He said, open your eyes and look at the water flowing. Do nothing else. I you watch. Various thoughts occurred at that time. Life is flowing. Who knows where it will Something was flowing, moving, going across. I don't know. My mind was lost in looking at that. I'd never seen a scene like that before. And then I suddenly realized that now I'm completely attentive and clear and calm. So, if at that time I had watched my breath, I didn't. I would have seen that the breath was, the breath was flowing in a very rhythmic pattern. It probably was imitating the flow of the river. Um, then, suppose I sit near the sea and watch the waves, or I'm in a forest looking at, sitting under a tree and hearing the insects, or looking at the grand mountains. I don't know if you have gone to the Himalayas. For instance, suppose you go to Kedar. A long time you're walking and walking, you're expecting that from the beginning you'll see snow-clad peak, nothing is there. And suddenly you turn the corner, and there you see this huge Himavan, as Kalidas explains, standing there snow-clad. Mm. He calls it Himalayo Nama Naga Raja. He stands there. Something happens, you, you're completely wiped out and at that time, the prana operating in very rhythmic, quiet pattern. Now the rishis, very intelligent people, because how would have done all this Upanishads? They said, if the state of mind is reflected in the pattern, rhythm of breathing, could it be that we can deliberately manipulate the breath and change its rhythms and patterns so that the mind can be made calm or quiet or active or whatever is necessary at that time. In fact, the entire science of pranayam stems from that. The connection between the rhythm of the breath and the mind state. So, yeah, so this is the basic um, since you are discussing the practicals, um, every day, if I can sit down in a quiet place, it could be even your uh, room, office room or your lab, somewhere where people don't come out and jut in and disturb and so on. Close your eyes. This is a preliminary pranayam, which can be done by anybody. It's part, it's, in, in fact, it's part of Vipassana also. The, traditionally, it's called anapana. In and out, going up, going in and going, or going up and going down. Um, if one sits quietly, first start with just watching the breath. Don't even control the pattern. Simply become aware of the breath. In fact, the word vipassana means awareness. Just be aware of the breath coming in and going out, coming in and going out, coming in. So sometimes you'll see that even the act of watching the breath has made the breathing pattern quiet and calm. It usually uh, starts with your wanting to give a deep sigh, like, and then you know that now it's relaxed, everything is quiet. And you keep, then you become aware of the rest of the body. If you're really quiet mind, you can hear your heart actually inside. Some people have described it as the beating of the damaru or drum. Actually, the heart, boom, boom, boom. You can hear it. Mind has become so sensitive. You have done nothing but become aware of your breath. And as you, where your mind goes deeper and deeper. Then after some time you'll hear some 
flowing sounds. Actually, the, it's not the Ganga flowing, it's your circulation, your blood flowing. And then various other little, little subtle things come out. And you're very calm and quiet and you're kind of filled with happiness. Uh, it starts with that. In fact, you're tracing your way to the ultimate happiness, which is your inner self. Um, then, the next step would be, after sitting and watching the breath without content, start actually breathing in and out deliberately, but very slowly. Take it in. Part of Kriya, of course, but not Kriya, because Kriya, we need personally to do it, not on the internet. So, mm. so when you take, inhale the breath, like, Hold it for a second. Exhale the breath. Important thing to note is you give complete attention to what you're doing. Not that you're looking there and then breathe. No. Your mind is totally occupied with the breath. I'm just describing the different aspects of pranaya. It's, it's, Big, but I'm trying to make it as small as possible. Um, so, when you do that, then your ida and the pingala become balanced. Everything is quiet and it's nice. You are balanced. Any decision taken at that time will be a balanced decision. So, breathe in. Now, before we go into this, I want to uh, discuss one more matter. Now, this you can practice. It's very simple. Anybody can practice. Uh, uh, you can't practice it only in one condition, which is when you're drunk, not advised. Because the nadis may go haywire here and there. Uh -huh. So, when you're very close to the spirit that comes in bottles, don't do the prana. Um, otherwise, that's also spirit, but it's a different spirit. It's called spirit because it induces some temporary samadhi sometimes. Mm. So, <clears throat> so you can sit down. First, watch the breath for a while. In out, when you're really quite calm at that point. Then start by deliberately taking a deep breath. Hold to the count of four. One, two, three, four. And then slowly allow the breath. No fast breathing. This is not bastrika. No fast breathing. Very slow. There are other kinds of pranayam, of course. We do that for a couple of rounds and then everything comes to Sit. And wherever you feel like fixing your attention, fix it and sit and enjoy. It will also bring your whole uh, mind into some kind of a balance. Um, now, let me go back a little bit and come again. You know, the most important sustenance, nutrition for our body, apart from food and water, is the breath. Everybody knows. You can live without food for some time. You can also live without water for some time. We cannot live without breath, which gives us oxygen, even for a minute and a half, not even that. How much can you hold your breath? Or ignore your breath? So it's such an important part of sustenance, of our sustenance. And yet we don't give any attention to it. We, if we give attention to our breath and what we breathe in, will Delhi's pollution be like this? We don't give any attention to our breath, which is one of which is the most important sustenance, without which one and a half minutes we cannot live without breathing. And it's so, so important that we hardly are aware of it or give any chance to even give attention to it. 
when we are born even when we are in the womb after a couple of weeks it starts beating and breathing and then when the child comes out of the womb then it breathes the fresh air outside the crying that you usually hear when the child comes out it's not cursing that is being born into this world which could be sometimes but uh, it's the breaking out of the you know, the first breath that the child is taking and coming out from a confined space and then this continues throughout our life when you are sleeping also you don't get up in the morning and say to your lungs breathe it just goes on whether you like it you ignore it you neglect it but it is going on you don't have to supply anything to like hunger you don't have to supply food it goes on and then one day when it decides to stop you know what happens finish um in gujarat they say off ho gaya off in kerala in malayalam is a it's a more funny word they said pancharai that means gone no air in the tube finished nobody can do anything that finished so it is so important the breath so if you call breath prana you see how important the rules and regulations of prana are and i am so i just wanted to go back and say this before we go into the controlling of the breath tension now in different rhythms of breathing different parts of the nadis function which is the importance of the different kinds of prana there is also what is called hyperventilation where you breathe quickly fast 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 and fill with so much oxygen that take everything out what happens here certain parts of our system begin become affected and you go into a meditative state uh carbon dioxide is reduced to a minimum in some of the pranayams in some pranayams more carbon dioxide enters the system but the yogi is in control he can switch it off when he wants push it off when he wants so since it's a life and death question the breath one has to be very careful about what one learns and from whom one learns and what one does otherwise instead of putting the system into order it may put the system into total disorder imbalance that's why some vedantin say you don't touch all that prana you will be danger because it has to be properly done then there is the other thing i said that there is the ida and there is the pingala now the balancing of the prana in the ida and pingala is done by a practical exercise called it's also called nadi shuddhi um alternate breathing the yogic term is anulom vilom uh where one holds you have to actually this is traditionally yes but you can also hold leg like, nothing will happen but all these years we have been doing this so i should i change so holding your left right nostril closed taking a deep breath hold then hold this close exhale then from where you exhale draw it in again this when you do alternate breathing if you want to know what happens when you do alternate breathing please in the evening before you eat food do alternate breathing do anulom vilom and see what's happening to the system first of all it becomes very restful why because the ida and the pingala are balanced the breath going to the left and the right nadis is balanced when it is balanced then the shushumna begins to function 
therefore you feel nice and peaceful. And you can get absorbed in the meditation. So these are some of the pranayams. Um, so this is pranayam. I roughly gave you a rough idea of uh, what pranayam is or could be. What are the nadis? What is prana? What is shvasa? And so on. In a nutshell. Now, what happens to prana? It brings about a balanced prana. And also big, takes us slowly in touch with the mukhya prana. The mukhya prana is, is, is mentioned because mukhya prana is supposed to be the most important aspect of prana, which is the kundalini. So when these two are balanced, then one is able to deal with that. Um, so the next anga, pranayama, is over. Not over, little bit over. Then pratyahara. Pratyahara is in <clears throat> various places. It has been translated by many as sense withdrawal. I think you don't give justice to the word pratyahara by the English word uh, sense withdrawal. Simply because in the English, the Sanskrit language is such that in English you cannot find an accurate translation for it. You, roughly yes. So what could be pratyahara? Pratyahara. Special um, ahara. So pratyahara is the capacity which the yogi develops through practice, which also consists of yama, niyama, asana and pranayama. Some people have a natural gift for it. They have never done any asana, no, nothing. They have a practical gift of pratyahara. So what is pratyahara? Pratyahara is the capacity generally developed, unless one is born with it, generally developed, where one is able to fix one's attention on something and at any given moment withdraw from it. This is very important to note. Not only to give attention to something, but to be able to switch your attention off when required so that it can be fixed somewhere else. Deliberately, not by accident. This activity, your sense organs are operating and you are Oh, experiencing, let's say, a particular sense organ. A yogi is one who at any given moment can switch it off and withdraw. When he withdraws, he can then fix his attention on something or just stay withdrawn for a while, doing nothing. This capacity developed through extensive practice because it is not easy. So therefore, just a yogi is not one who meditates when he is driving. Or thinking of his car when he is meditating. And this capacity is developed through pratyahara. Imagine what will happen if even normally, if you are driving, especially a fast car, nowadays lots of... Uh, MGs and Kias and all are on the road. Huh? What will happen if I meditate while I'm driving? Danger to me and danger to the public. When I'm meditating, I'm meditating. When I'm driving, I'm... If I'm fully occupied with complete attention in my driving, that itself is a meditation. Not when I'm driving and thinking of meditating, no. So, pratyahara is, roughly people say sense, withdrawal, capacity to switch off and on at will. Because we believe that when you do one thing, you should be doing one thing, not something else. If this is practiced for a long time, then it becomes one point in this. Um, since we are going to have more sessions and so on, so I will tell you a little story about this, something called, about pratyahara. This is a story about uh, a Zen master. Mm. Yes. 
was the Zen master. He went from Tamil Nadu, from the south. He's a founder of Zen. Huh? Bodhi Dharma. See, our friends, they all know everything. If I forget, they remind. So, that's nice. So, Bodhi Dharma went from Tanjau, somewhere in the south of Minadin. Uh, he took up a particular uh, Buddhist practice uh, or a uh, way of practicing which concentrated mostly on dhyana. So he, dhyana is meditated, which is the next step after pratyahara. So he called it dhyana buddhism. It is this dhyana and our man uh, Bodhidharma in those days traveled to China. He was allowed to teach there because there was no Chinese Communist Party. CCP was not in existence. He was allowed to teach. So, uh, Bodhidharma set up a place on the top of the mountain, somewhere on a hill, in a quiet place. Two young men who wanted to learn, okay, now Dhyana, when it went to China, became Chana. Chan. And when Chan was exported to Japan, it became Zen. So the origin is Tanjau. <laughs> so anyway, so um, um, he was sitting on the top of a hill and two young aspirants who were really wanted to learn Zen, you know, the samadhi or the state of freedom or nirvana in the uh, Zen system in Japanese is called Sathori. So they went uh, looking for him. Those days it was very difficult to look for a person like that, sit, staying in a hill alone. There is no advertisement, there are no banners, there are no internet, there is no Google God, no G. Uh, so they had to search and search the whole day without food and finally they found him. And uh, they climbed up the hill and they were very tired, clothes dirty. Then they saw the master sitting. I don't know if you have seen any painting of Bodhidharma. He looks quite... Uh, you you'd get intimidated looking at a person like that. Huge man with a moustache and so on. Tamil Nadu is famous for those moustaches. Anyway, so he was sitting there and these people went and said, Sir, and it was lunch time, only one meal, single meal, and that was the soup in the bowl. So Bodhidharma was drinking the soup when they went, sitting cross-legged, of course. These boys went and said, Sir, we have come all this way. Look at us. We are so tired, whole day. No food, no water, fine. But we came what? To learn Zen. Please give us Zen. Teach us how to attain Satori. Bodhidharma said, I am drinking my soup. He said, what the hell, we came all this way, we are saying something so important. And this guy is saying, I'm drinking my soup. How silly. So they asked again. When they asked again, he called his assistant and said, give them their soup. So they brought two wooden bowls with soup and spoon and meat. And they were about to drink, they were hungry. Then they suddenly thought, what are we doing? Drinking soup? We came for Zen. They put the bowl down. And then they again asked, Sir, Reverend Master, give us Zen. He said, I am drinking my soup. They got really upset and agitated. They said, we are also drinking our soup. But that is the, what they could do then. Nothing else was there. There was a soup. We are also He said, no. 
he stopped then. He finished his soup, so he put the bowl down. And he said, no, you are not drinking your soup. You are drinking your soup. And you are thinking of Zen. I am drinking my soup. I am drinking my soup. I am drinking my soup. This is Zen. One pointed. Kinshin. You, then when you teach Zen, you are on Zen, not on the soup. You are not eat, drinking the soup and thinking of Zen. Two things. This is roughly an uh, idea of what Pratyahara is. And by what Patanjali calls Nairantariya Bhyasena, regular, constant practice, one achieves the capacity to do that. Then the mind becomes one-pointed. No more is it distracted. When it becomes one-pointed, that one-pointed attention, either on an object or on a thought or on a sound or on an idea or on an image, not all together, an image, one-pointed attention on any one of these is called dharana, which is the doorway to dhyana, which we normally call meditation. Dharana is one-pointed attention exclusively to something. Now, if you love the thing that you are doing, then there is no problem with dharana. Suppose I love music. People ask me, oh, when I sit down to meditate, one-pointedly, then the mind wanders. I'm thinking of uh, masala or whatever things in their mind. Um, I ask them, when you are, suppose you like something, and you are doing what you like, does your mind wander? No, it doesn't. Why is it wandering? One, because the importance of what your doing has not come home, stuck home yet. <laughs> uh, it's not the most important. We are doing it, somebody said to him, okay. But how important it is, when that becomes clear, then one-pointedness doesn't require much effort. Especially if you have gone through the rest of the steps. And secondly, if you are seriously interested in music, for instance, you are listening. It's completely one-pointedly. Nobody is forcing you to listen. You love it, so you are listening to it. One-pointed attention. Now the difficulty is, the mind, by its very nature, not in its true nature, in its true nature it's completely still, but in the nature of the mind as we know of, which is attracted, angry, confused, the mind we know of, it cannot stay without thought or without thinking. It always needs something to occupy itself. And not one thing, but a succession of objects or a succession of thoughts to occupy it, can generally not be still moving. Now, it is not possible to make the mind, who by its very nature is thought, and thought is always waves coming and going, to make into a vacuum, or to still, or to get into shunya. It's not in his nature. It's like nature as a borsa vacuum. We try to keep it here, try to rush in. So the only way is to free the mind from outward occupation is to turn it to some inward occupation first, before it becomes still. And the in one of the inward occupations is to link your mind to your breath. It's an occupation, it's an action. You're breathing in and you're breathing out. You're completely attending on the breathing in and breathing out and breathing. So your mind is occupied in something internal, not external. When it is occupied in something internal, gradually the disturbances move off, fall off. And then the mind is steady and quiet and tranquil. Then it can be applied to higher things. 
is another reason why pranayam or watching the breath especially being aware of the breath is important because it keeps your mind occupied internally instead of external so anyway so one point of attention is dharana could be a sound an idea it could be an image it could be whatever and better something that appeals to you not something that doesn't appeal to you for instance if you love om keep it there in fact if you love jesus put him there if you try to push and replace om oh, oh, it don't work that way all our life we have been we love buddha keep the buddha there fix one point at it don't say i have somebody is a teacher coming from a shaivite background you should concentrate only on shiva one point at attention will be very difficult to attain for him it's okay it's like trying to tell a vaishnava to worship shiva or a shaivite to worship narayana it doesn't work because they have been brought up their whole background the thoughts everything is different or a person who believes in the formless you say you have to meditate on this form it doesn't work so make sure before one point the attention is given that object or that idea which you are keen on being one pointed about is something that you love something that you can relate to at least in some way <clears throat> when this happens when this become one pointed means what then there is only that attention nothing else remains when this stretches on for a length of time it becomes dhyana the root word of dhyana, the root of dhyana the word dhyana is dhyo then dhyo yo na prajodhayat gayatri is last sentence so when dharana stretches for a length of time it becomes dhyana and when dhyana continues they say like oil falling from one vessel to another continuous stream there's no break then one understands what is called samadhi which is a culmination of ashtanga yoga not only ashtanga yoga any yoga yogic path culminates in a state called samadhi and there are different forms of different stages of samadhi till one finally reaches what is called nirvikalpa a samadhi or a trance state where no vikalpa remains everything is quiet everything is complete you may call it nirvana moksha kaivalya but samadhi is the beginning stage towards that it is not the end it is the beginning from where one goes to the higher levels but it is necessary to have samadhi now how does samadhi happen in dhyana samadhi happens when the meditator the object that is being or the idea that is being meditated upon and the act of meditation itself become one there are no two or three there in fact one is so absorbed in whatever one is meditating on that one has forgotten even one's own existence let us put it that way another way i don't exist there is only that when this happens it's called samadhi and it's usually accompanied by a blissful sensation not a frightening or a painful situation a very blissful situation and if it is actually samadhi then the mind has now transcended we will discuss this maybe in the next session somewhere about this transcending and from earth to mm, water to uh, agni to air to the higher akasha and so on so at the moment all we can say is if anybody has even a glimpse or experience of samadhi then one's in understanding improves one's one pointedness improves one's mind becomes balanced and quiet and tranquil and one is able to understand things better than when one before one entered samadhi 
uh, yogi, because of his capacity for one pointedness, may be able to understand a subject faster than one whose mind is always distracted and wandering. And therefore, may be able to acquire more wisdom than a person whose mind has not stopped being distracted. Um, now, this question of wisdom and knowledge, it's a big question. So, we cannot, it's already one hour, the session. Um, Vasanay, before I wind up this session, let me tell you that I don't think wisdom is the same as knowledge. So, um, so we'll stop for today. Thank you very much. We still can have half an hour of interaction, which we always have after each session. Uh, Pranam Guruji. So, Guruji, my question is that uh, if a person after a long time meditation, can I, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. If okay. a person okay. after, after hmm. long time meditation hmm. and he achieves a state of Samadhi, mm -hmm. what would be his uh, daily life would be hmm. uh, and how would he behave or how would he remain? Like this was the question also asked in Bhagavad Gita that uh, Arjuna asked, what if the person is uh, achieves the state of sthit pragya? How do he remain? How does he behave? How does? Ah, yes. Actually, it's a very nice question. Uh, yes, some people think that those who have attained the yogic uh, samadhi, nirvana, and so on, they are odd people who can't function in this world. Uh, you know, uh, that they are out of uh, society. Uh, not, not true. It takes... Look, hopefully I have done some yoga. I've got some samadhi or whatever. Hopefully. And I live in this world. First of all, I'm a married man. I have two kids who got married themselves. Ah, I function... If you think that because of Samadhi, I have become a lazy guy who is sitting here doing nothing. There are some, some such people. It depends on various factors. I am busy from the morning till evening. Something or the other is going on. If it is not interaction, it is some other inter or some people coming. Then there are questions. Then there it goes on and then there are some administrative matters coming up. So how does a person who has reached Titi Pratna handle this world? Same question asked by Arjuna because he thought if I attain Nirvana, maybe I will stop all this and go back home and sit down and meditate. What am I doing here? So Krishna very quickly tells him, look, that's not the state. When you have touched the state of your prajna becoming steady, prajna, you can actually function in this world if you want to. And because you have any desires to fulfill, you can function in this world and function more efficiently perhaps than a person who has not touched Tita Prajna. Because you are not swayed by your uh, emotions. Your mind is steady. You have learned one-pointed attention. And you also realize that ultimately the heaven is not going to fall on us. The, this inner self is self-sufficient. Having understood this, if a person sits in the middle of this world and starts working, I think that work will be uh, better than when he has not touched the state of Samadhi. Or the state of being a state of Then you work without regrets. Then you work without partiality. Then you work without getting agitated if somebody says something. What would they say? They may say something about the body. But the inner self, can anybody say anything about it? So if you have touched it, then your mind is steady. 
So I would say that tomorrow if you, Nitesh, become a Sthita Prajna, I'm not sure if you are not one. I'm joking. Um, you will be able to do whatever you're doing in the IIT better. <laughs> and you will be able to manage and live in this world in a better way. And probably you will benefit more people than you are able to benefit when you are not. So, in fact, Arjuna has an how does he eat, how does, how does he be, yeah, how does he, everything is, becomes moderate and everything becomes enjoyable. One is not put off by negative uh, reactions. The mind is crystal clear and you are able to function smoothly. This is what it is. Sir, I wanted to know that in that state, whether the person is unaffected by any emotions or whether his mind processing, because we have to live in our daily life, we have to perform our daily activities. So, what is that difference? Is that is he uh, emotionless or something? <laughs> what, what type of emotions? He, he does not become emotionless. I am going to tell you a story. When uh, Swami Vivekananda, you heard of Swami Vivekananda, of course. Who hasn't heard of me? Uh, was wandering in Maharashtra somewhere. When he was an unknown entity. He became known only after he went to Chicago and had the conference and so on. Before that he was unknown and he was changing his names constantly wherever he went to keep people from knowing who he was. In one place in Maharashtra, a known acquaintance came and told him that one of his old schoolmates, Swamiji's schoolmates, who was his good friend, had died. Suddenly, Swami Vivekananda burst into tears. He wept. Of course, he recovered himself very fast. But he wept and he said, Oh, I'm feeling so sorry. He was such a good man. He was my closest friend. So this guy was confused and surprised. He said, I thought you were a monk who is free of all emotions. Why are you crying when you're... He said, do you think I worked all these years in the spiritual field to make my heart into stone? He said, the sign of a heart which has touched the higher is that it melts at the slightest. But I can recover fast, that he recovered from it immediately and said, okay, done. This is the state. It's not as if one becomes emotionless. In fact, once emotion becomes, emotions become more finer, subtler. And, but one is in complete control of one's emotions. You can switch it off at any time you want. That improves also the way you live in this life. I think you got what I'm trying to say. I'm also not a heartless man. I feel for everything. But that doesn't mean I'm affected by that in the way which a person or somebody might keep become depressed for days together because that person died. It's not like that. You also know that if you don't stand steady, how can you make somebody else stand steady on it? You have to be steady. But not out of callousness, but out of concern. These are two things. Which means a yogi or a Siddha Pradhyaya is not a callous human being who doesn't care what you know. It's not like that. It's that he can bring about the stability of mind at any given moment. Shall we move? Nitish. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Welcome. Sir, thank you so much for all the time and, and more than that, your your presence, you know, it's it's it has been a, a great journey. Uh, sir, my question is related to institutional level and organizational level suggestion. Not long ago, I was a, a UG student in IIT and when the whole stream is in one direction, you're trying to swim against, 
even sometimes even within families you don't get support and i have met souls wonderful people students were struggling with this so what will be your recommendation that we as institutional level organizational level can do to support individuals to move on this path i think and the first i don't know i have not been in i studied in the iit so i don't know exactly how the situation is there but uh, i've gone to college studied in other places and so on i don't think it's peculiar to the iit it's there whenever there are a group of students gathering together how do you support them first we have to learn to stand on our own feet plus share your feelings and understanding about the alternate ways of life so which means while you all your serious classes are going on about your science and whatever you are studying have some classes or gatherings where you can sit together share your views air your views and allow them to come out so that you can sort it out it's necessary of course for one leader to be there the leader need not be a 100% perfect person but at least one who understands that dialogue and discussion and airing of what one feels can generally arrive at a solution and not keeping it inside if you don't air your feelings when i say air feeling not with brick bats from the mind where you sit together like friends that's what you called a satsang actually sit together and have a responsible person handle the session and air your feelings let people talk openly not angrily but openly and discuss the matter this should be also part of not only the uh, one educational institution but all educational institutions throughout the world especially when where people of the ages of pg ug levels come together they need something they need to have i would say it would be like a, a, a counseling session mm, it could be like also a psychiatric section but not through one person but on on the whole people can sit down and discuss things openly without feeling that if i openly discuss i'm hurting somebody this is possible i don't know if any such process or initiative has taken place but i think it's possible to do that uh many problems can be solved thank you sir namaste guruji Okay. Sir, to you is uh, like uh, my next life will be governed by whatever the past karma I have accumulated till now. So I want to ask, like, what about my first life? My when there were no any karma, how I have got any body? There must be some cause. The problem is that it is not possible to find out where it all started. but the fact is what facts are there now we know we cannot find out what was our earliest karmas or where it started but we know that there are karmas and this is the effect of the karma that we are going through it's very simple today if something happens in this life it is because of something i did right yes that yeah. right in the same way if there is a result now it has there has to be a cause somewhere somewhere that i am not able to understand the cause need not does not mean that there is no cause for it right preliminary cause or whatever so uh, to find out where why what was my original uh, karma before it all started is almost like a child asking its parents that if you love me so much why didn't you invite me for your wedding <laughs> <laughs> i hope you get what i'm trying to say so that is because 
Why I'm saying this is because there must be some seed from which an activity has come. There must be a cause. At my stage of thought, I'm not able to understand that cause. But I cannot dismiss the fact that there is a cause and effect. Now, the central point of point of the karmic theory is that tomorrow, forget about what was before, nobody Hardly anybody knows about past lives anyway. So, hmm? Forget about that original, even last past life, we don't know. In fact, many people don't even believe that it exists. So let's leave it there. But the crux of the karma theory is that what you can't go back and tinker with the past, right? Can you? You can't. So what is the theory? The theory is that what you do today will decide your tomorrow. What you did in the past, or where is, we don't know. We cannot do anything about it. We can't go back and tinker with it. We don't even know where it is, whether it exists at all. We can't tinker. But if the karmic theory is that what you do, every action has every as a cause. So if you are thinking of your future, which we don't know. It's only projection of the mind. We don't know. Present we know. To a great extent, that too. We don't know completely, but to a great extent, we know about the present. So if you know how, what you do now will decide your future. This is the crux of the karmic theory. So there is no point in trying to go back and you cannot actually uh, tinker with what happened before, if it has happened. Now we can do something right so that the future is looked after. That much we can do. And perhaps when the mind attains clarity, it might be able to understand the root cause of everything, where it started. If the mind has not attained that clarity, it is very difficult even for someone who has touched it to explain it to the person. Somewhere it has started with a desire. This much I can tell you. Okay. Uh, Namaste Guruji. So uh, my question is, if one wants to start practicing asanas uh, so as a beginner, so is there a source from where one can learn with proper technique? Because if, if we start doing asana with the wrong technique, then it can be very harmful. You are, you are absolutely right. So, uh, two suggestions. One, start with simple asanas first. And if possible, have a teacher who is teaching. I am not very happy about learning asanas from books. Very simple books are available on asanas. Swami Shivananda's books are there. Uh, uh, Mongir School of Yoga has books on asanas. Hatha Yoga Pradipika has 81 asanas. I would suggest that you find a proper teacher. You need not have to practice all the asanas. Uh, what suits you at that particular point, which is necessary for you, that is enough. Although, there are general asanas which everybody can practice. So, you need to find an, a, a teacher who, is, who has already trained many people and whose students have no complaints. Okay. okay. And who don't have joint pain because they have been taught. Hmm? Or who, whose life has somehow become better by practicing asanas, health and life and everything. So you have to look around. Don't be in a hurry and find a teacher. Okay, sir. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent sessions and I uh, hope that you come back, you know, we'll have a few more sessions of yours. Uh, I have a very, uh, question you talked about in the practice of pranayama, you take the breath and you hold the breath and then you breathe out. But in some schools, they teach that, you know, initially at least when you do pranayama, you should not do breath hold. Hmm. So, uh, now, what is the reason behind that? Uh, uh, yeah, initially... They're right in a way, because initially when you start your pranayama, it's a good thing to 
irrigate your uh, nadis by simply breathing in and out before starting to hold the breath. True. However, I come from a traditional school which believes that asana, it should have both rechaka, puraka and kumbhak, which means holding. The difficult, the, the important thing is to make sure that that holding or what you call kumbhak does not become very long. It should be very short periods before the lungs get adjusted to the whole system. So I would put it this way that while there is no harm in holding the breath even in the beginning, but that holding should not be a strained affair. It should be a gentle affair and the period should be as short as possible till we develop. I think so. When I teach yoga, I also first give a lot of anulom milom in breathing out, breathing without stopping. And then slowly go on to kumbak. Kumbak is holding. And uh, the other question I have is again a short one. You talked about pratyahara. And here you are saying that, uh, I mean, a lot of explanations of pratyahara is, you know, sensory withdrawal, as you mentioned. But here you are saying ability to detach the attention, which is a very different. Uh, so are That's there any specific practices that will enable one to do that? Yes. The practices that will enable one to do prop practice pratyahara, basically to indulge yourself, allow your senses to indulge in something that you really love. Um, mm -hmm like music or art, something which you really love. It could be drama, it could be anything. And then begin to practice stopping it off at any given moment and moving out of it. It comes only through practice. It cannot be done in a single day. That's why Patanjali says, Nairantariya Abhyasana, regular practice. Practice because the mind is not accustomed to this. When it gets caught in something, it continues to get caught, especially if it is enjoying it. Mm -hmm. So, through practice, you should be able to give an interval when you want and not when the cinema gives you an interval. Okay. It needs practice, of course. First, you'll be disgusted. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm watching something, so why should I stop it? Then later on, you'll realize that stopping is as important as watching. From the yogic point of view, not other point of view. So now I yeah. think it's... Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, everybody. You. All the students, professors, whoever took part in this.